Crimson Rice is a collection of Vietnam poems. The poems are not lovely. Theirs is the harsh music of confrontation, in war, in love, in the soul. Each poem acts as a record of devastation, with only a few offering any glimpse of regeneration. How can a poet fight past the images broadcast into American living rooms during the most thoroughly televised war of all times? Lacan does it by direct assertion. This is not television. And by focusing unflinchingly on the suffering of individual people whose bodies and families have been broken, whose dreams and lives have been derailed or obliterated. Crimson Rice is a collection of Vietnam poems written by Serge Lacan. It was originally published by the Librado Press in 1990 with lithographs by Kathy Walden Kaplan. This book is dedicated to my brother Christian Lacan, who served with the First Cavalry and who died at the age of 56, and to John Rocco Janeiro, a friend and medic, and to the men and women of the Medical Corps who served in Vietnam, and to the Vietnamese people who suffered the most during the war. Vietnam Vignettes 1 Bamboo-colored women call this number one, 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 boosting our egos as they butterflied and bumblebeeled our bellies, 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 bursting to feel manly as they fed us bamboo-colored breasts exploding in our faces like grenades scattered like stars into oblivion bamboo-colored women mothers of unwanted children of unwanted mothers two flies laying eggs on his chapped lips 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 kissed by a girl in brooklyn brooklyn bridge is falling down Falling down, falling down, lips worn out by bamboo women, honorable and loyal, he said, to the lips in Brooklyn, longing for other lips and blood, blood, bloodthirsty lips yearning for love, far away love, in a fairy tale land where love is but a dream, flies laying eggs in the bellies of women, yearning to be free of lips eggs, children, free, free, free. Three, his head split open, emptying a child he had always been, at play perhaps, with a toy gun, playing soldier for grown-ups who saw the child in him, trapped in the body of a man, playing woman, a doll dressed as a girl he could have been, ironing and washing dishes for his mother, tired of chores and the five boys she had borne, wishing for a girl instead of the son, lying in a crimson rice field. Monsoons Rain beat images out of brains, losing blood, washed out thoughts, lost in rivulets, flowing into greater oceans where blood can no longer be colored red. This is not an invasion. The man with the crooked nose shined blue on the tube as he pointed to a map where no one had ever been, where everyone wanted to go, where trucks would make new tracks in the name of peace, where toy-like tanks would raise sleepy towns in the name of ill-defined freedoms, where soldiers could find fertile fields of whores growing in the distance as the man with the crooked nose uttered, This is not an invasion.
mother's milk. The field is peaceful, its water smooth and sunny, its men and women asleep in pools of crimson rice. An aimless ox bellows for the burden she is so used to in search of the peasant who beat her to plow the field, now peaceful and smooth, its men and women asleep as the lost ox bellows like an old toothless woman crying mutely for the calf killed before it could taste its mother's milk. Kudzu. Old Mac from Mississippi grew tired of sweet-smelling kudzu and stepped off a plane into a rice field where he glistened in oil and sun like a bronzed warrior in a park with bandoliers, helmet, and cigar, his gun ready for action, straight out of some comic strip war where heroes never die. Old Mac was Johnny Reb, giving them hell, never showing others he was scared, because they were scared, until one night he cried for Mama to hold him in her arms, remembering the day his grandpa took him coon hunting, and he got lost, like those stars above, in a universe too big for them, crying for Mama, and wish he could throw his gun and smell the sweet scent of kudzu forever. What price? The urchin slipped out of his mother's womb like a koi taking to street water in a stream of men the color of algae, his hand outstretched for Hershey bars they gave willingly in the name of freedom, spelled in caps, the way he would reach out to men in black who promised him real freedom from the men in green for the price of a bowl of rice and a gun in his urchin hands. To wake up, he stumbled into rooms where he prayed on her with fists, drunken, but steady every night, as she cried her frightened blue eyes out, while he raged to be free of the shrapnel, once embedded in his brain, like a knob on a television set, resurrecting friends long dead, he wanted to kill, to love his scarred wife, and sleep, 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 Pity. They loved her yellow satin skin, those men in green, grinning for the love they misspelled in the name of truth and Coca Cola. She hoard for bread their white, spongy Eucharist she sold for perfume to make them hers, hoping one would take pity and take her to the land where dreams can come true. She hoard for wine to wash away the stale taste of their flesh eating at her soul. They loved her yellow satin skin, those grinning men splitting her flesh open as they sat casting lots for the spongy yellow fabric of her skin while she laughed and cried within for one who would take pity. Burning Orange Out of the temple, where he tempered his soul, an orange Buddhist monk rushes along a dusty road in search of his boyish self in a field where a wild-eyed ox stands as helpless as the peasant, watching goony birds hover over green shoots of rice. 
An orange Buddhist monk shakes his fist as he speaks of God, life, and the sanctity between man and earth in a field where men in green tote guns and laugh at the fool, following them like an orange butterfly, beating its fragile wings to fight coarseness with beauty. He sets himself on fire, thinking the sun bursting out of him would burn them out of reality. Doing his duty. Boredom drowned a July landscape of dry hills and pallet which made him thirsty, drunken high on a toilet seat from which he fell like a cowboy off his saddle and landed on a broken woman inhabiting his head and awoke in a faraway bed and a hand with a purple heart for doing his duty. At the altar, mother built a wall with him in various poses, caught next to tanks in postcards of faraway places, always signed with love for her, now staring at faded purple hearts hanging out to dry next to an ochre-skinned woman who killed him one night because she believed in a promise made in frenzied pleasure, forgotten with appeasement, remembered by her, pinned on a wall, faced by mother, wailing at the altar for the only son she could ever have. A Abetting Viet Cong swarm black through the village like ants, following the scent of food they took from him, rooted to the ground where tomorrow men of another color would burn his house down for the aid he had not given his own brothers. The Six O'Clock News Eviscerated friends accompany him all day long as they moan insanely, cursing culprits in the hills, pain killing all reasons for being here, Eviscerated friends bleed in his mind all day long until they are removed by metal in the sky. Evening fire zips across the horizon like lizard tongues, aflame and awesome, as he sees his belly open to flies, his lips dry as sand, dying with no loved one to hold his hand. This is not television. Training to die. He was a feather in midair, making loving loops in the clouds for his wife below, looking up at the silver fish drowning in blue while he thought of imaginary killing safe in the womb of metal until one day like Icarus, he flew too close to the sun and melted down to his wife below. They called him Henry Stokes. The bird he flew smoked in a field where men combed grasses and reeds for his scalp they found growing in a tree like a fleece of old no longer golden, and threw it in a bag. They trudged on for more of him and found two booted feet, a wallet without money or ID, the Polaroid of a naked but beloved woman, perhaps his wife, who kept him alive in spite of the distance between them, a ring in his pocket he wore in her presence, no tags, name, religion, or blood type. 
they combed the grasses and reeds for more of him, and in the end, they tagged the lot anonymous. Fated. A sniper got him in the spine. He sank into a fog, unfeeling pain, and landed in a wheelchair on a porch, shaking his head, raging to tell those too young to know that wars are fought by stupid men, unhappy with their lots. They tried to bring the whole world down. They wouldn't hear of peace and had to have their own little war to understand what pain was like while he sits, cursing women he could have loved, angry at the world for having volunteered when he could have driven his car over a cliff one night and landed in this chair because it was to be. Letter to Mom The weather's fine. Raining like hell. And the guys are a fine bunch. Almost killed Mac for calling me names. Staying out of trouble. Drinking like crazy. Taking orders like a regular trooper. You'd be proud of me, Mom. The colonel's an asshole. I miss Jenny so much. Tell her for me, again and again, to wait till I come back. Screwed my first woman yesterday. Tell Dad not to worry about my making it. The son of a bitch made me go. I'm doing fine. I can't wait to come home. Love, your son. And there was light. They pressed her ochre flesh and made her kiss the earth beneath her feet because they were God sent to free her with their seed growing along the road she took. Frightened by men in green who smiled because of her pretty face like a Madonna wanting the child in spite of men trampling her mind, their guns going off, her mother dead, her brother lost, in spite of the pain she felt between her legs, split by a dark head emerging into day to see what light was like after the darkness within her. He promised. He promised me a horse. Sis, a brand new doll. Mom, a shiny diamond ring. But Dad went off to war and died for promises he couldn't keep. Foolishness. He dreamed of a peaceful field, home, his wife, of when he was a boy. They broke his hands to make him talk. He cried in agony, and the pain killed foolish thoughts of war. He had uttered as a young man who did not think he could be caught. They shoved him naked into pits with rats. He begged like a child for his mother, not realizing the day of freedom when he would utter foolish words about, if I had to do it again, I'd... Dear John, Johnny lay peacefully nailed to a field like freshly cut wood oozing in spring to water green shoots of rice the smoothness of which his fingers seemed to touch too late in life when yesterday his voice bounced in a club about beer horse and battle when tomorrow he would have gotten slapped by a letter two weeks late written by a wife who wanted him out of her life completely. Kamikaze women. They exchanged their black uniforms for the ephemeral blues of silken butterflies in search of nectar in the night. Like praying mantis on the prowl, 
They stalk the streets for men of brass to light their lives just for one night. Blind men of passion, they sought the honeyed scent of lips and breasts they fed upon. But in the morning light, wings of iridescent blue lay next to men easily spent in a season too short to promise life. For comfort, she had given her pale breast in the night to comfort the ball of flesh, now in a man-sized box, covered with cloth, as she clutched the arm of her husband, who spoke of honor she could not understand, for the leg of her son once broken, for the girl he was to marry, for the grandchild she would have rocked to sleep, for the pain and tears he was causing her now, as she threw herself forward to protect them from the dirt they were throwing on the box containing the remains of her son, and then they gave her the cloth for comfort. No Man's Land He stepped into a no man's land of sultry grasses, bleeding from the bullet in his leg. In the shade of his scope, he watched the enemy blend serenely with the shape of an olive-skinned woman in his still youthful arms and smiled as he aimed for the heart with the barrel in his blood-stained hands while he watched them kiss, jealous of their momentary happiness. He pulled the trigger, and watched him scream mutely, then fall dead. He smiled for the pain in his leg he had eased in this no man's land, where his arbitrary right was the other's selfish wrong. Young Michael McGinnis Young Michael McGinnis, with down upper lip, bandana and mane to his shoulders like a maiden embroidered of flowers and birds handed daisies to the left and to the right he told them of love in an ancient book of love they sang in hymns of love they sold with rings of love where seasons are ripe for loving to passers-by he told of war death and pestilence and crying children and beaten women and of his crippled brother in a wheelchair, until one day a vitriolic man in coat and tie had young Michael McGinnis arrested for being unpatriotic. And so on. She had expected him to return from a mission advertised as violent, mellowed by beliefs, which submitted him to the earth below, as tears streamed bitterly with words of vengeance she would teach her sons to keep her love alive for him, until none remains but her, weeping for her sons, and so on. Fragging He was ordered to kill the invisible for reasons other than his own. His gun pointed at the sun, a target he wanted real, when he remembered the woman lost to a clean-shaven head he would bleed for with the light touch of skin and metal for the love he couldn't define. The Idol Like an idol of bronze, corroding in the heat, a distorted face with eagle on its shoulders screamed to be fed, ordering gullible you to kill those different from them so that it might taste the blood of eternity. Loving She couldn't wait to see him off, not waving, not in tears, Tired of the man playing manly games for the forgotten boy within him who would taunt her if he died. 
He stepped out into a fog of men and women. He flew into a cloud, both in search of their elusive selves. He would kill men, women, and children. He would curse in her name. She made love to all she met, killing him with each of them. In Retribution The young wife wept for the child in her belly, a growing image of the impetuous young man who left her like a street knight in search of adventure to tell himself he was alive away from her, she being safe in a tower on 53rd, where he had thought life sterile, he went to war in the name of God and country. She walked into a park one night, was raped and murdered, identified and buried in retribution by the God he was fighting for. Shooting Blanks He shot from his empty gun like a hero falling off only to get up again to fight in the magic of images where eternity is bought for the price of a ticket while his thoughts spilled in a battlefield bathed with crimson for ideas sown by others. He, the fool in Christ, dying, a coward in disguise for the empty gun he shot in earnest for others to see. Oasis She had buried 365 days on the red and green crosses in a room where she preserved her virginity in a shell unbroken, waiting for him to free the woman in her. She spent evenings alone writing letters of love, which now sounded like jingles too rehearsed in her mind dreaming of a house with him in the country with their children when she heard he was back from the war at her door where he begged her forgiveness to free him from his promise given the evening he left to find his true self either in Paris or Rome, perhaps in a desert in Egypt where nothing grows so that man is his only oasis. one-way ticket. She played the ancient game under the imaginary tree where she hiked her legs to show she was no ordinary woman, tired of planting rice and being honest in muddy fields. She lured him so she could bathe in milk and honey. She let him taste of manhood while dreaming of a way out of devastated roads with no real exits, while he believed in love, not knowing he was her ticket out. Danang Dump We dumped tons of tin with traces of food, food yellow fingers licked like human flies, clothed in black, heads with miniature pagodas rising and falling to the beating of tin, tin dinning in the distance like an ancient call for prayer, empty of power like the shells they crushed into ashtrays. Without End An old woman in a waiting room, knits a sock for her husband, whose leg now grows in a battlefield like a flower plucked by a young man in love with the woman before him, where a girl drags a blind doll across the floor, where they all wait for a train pushed by a young man dreaming of bigger trains and a day when everything would begin all over again. 
These poems teach us that we cannot afford to miss the irony of a peace that comes only in death. We cannot afford to send another generation of men and women into this sleep. Lecomte served as a rescue medic in the U.S. Air Force in the States from 1965 to 1969. He now resides in Bellingham, Washington.